Did you know that fluctuations in our blood sugar can actually influence our skin? Blood sugar regulation is important not only for managing conditions like diabetes, but also for learning valuable insights about the ways that our body functions. Our sponsor for today's episode is Very, an excellent tool for finding out personal insights about your blood sugar. While some blood sugar fluctuations can be felt through symptoms, they are not always reliable, as low and high blood sugar can sometimes mimic similar symptoms. If you want real-time data and true scientifically driven insights about your blood sugar, try Very. If you want to find the right foods and habits for your body while improving your health, give Vary a shot with our exclusive $30 off code VSM dash quiet the diet and check out the link in the description notes to purchase directly from their website. Blood sugar management, as we talk about on this podcast, is a foundational piece of any health condition you're facing and getting real time data can be so, so valuable. So we're so excited to have Vary for a sponsor on this episode. Hi, I'm Michelle Shapiro, integrative functional registered dietitian and host of the Quiet the Diet podcast. On this episode of Quiet the Diet, we'll be sitting down with the brilliant Krista Beegler, another incredible anti-inflammatory nutritionist who is going to take us through skin conditions and the functional nutrition approach to having great and healthful skin. We talk about how skin approaches are generally applied externally, but what we can do internally to support our skin as well. We'll talk about detox and drainage and a slew of other topics that we know will be so exciting and supportive for you. We can't wait to see you in there. I am over the moon to have my friend, my colleague, my brilliant colleague, Krista Beegler with with me here today. You may know her as the anti-inflammatory nutritionist, or you may know her from her amazingly successful podcast, Less Stress Life. Krista, I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited that I'm here too, because your podcast is really gaining a ton of, like, it's just incredible. The, and this is the right platform for you. Sometimes we try to hang out on the platform that's not, you actually do perfectly everywhere, but for me, podcast is the right place. And I feel like that's where the world has needed you for a long time. So I'm thrilled to be here. You've had a lot of amazing guests. I'm not going to stand for these compliments. You're the guest here today. Okay. I'll be complimenting you the rest of the time. Podcasting is definitely a platform for you too. And the way that your beautiful brain works, I know we can go in a million different directions today, but the direction we're going to start with and then roll with is skin, Mm -hmm. because this is something that you've been the master expert in for a long time. I'm sure when you first started working on skin conditions with clients from a functional nutrition perspective, it may have been like less popular and people like did not, hadn't heard of it before. So I'm curious to also hear just how you kind of came to be the amazing practitioner, educator, teacher that you are. Mm. I didn't choose skin. Skin chose me. (laughs) And it can be a frustrating thing if you've dealt with any skin issues. It's the thing that sometimes breaks the camel's back in terms of people wanting to actually get support because they don't like when they have skin issues, right? They may have had gut issues that they could hide, but then once they get skin issues, it's a problem. So this all stemmed out of my own history when I was I was a contractor. I'm going to try to be brief. I was a contractor. I had a couple small kids. I was starting a new business. And then there was I this the the event that changed everything. I went to the pool with my kids five days in a row and I broke out in a severe rash. Now I had had winter time, what I called, we all do this, must be genetic <laughs> eczema in high school because um, I'd used a little cream in the winter. It would come and go. It was like not a big deal because I thought it was normal. But obviously when your um, eye is like swollen shut, it is not normal all of a sudden, right? So that was not very fun uh, to overcome because there was actually no one that really knew what they were doing that could help. I did see a lot of practitioners and a lot of healers and ultimately had to do a deep dive into the research and just kind of ended up with the right things and got lucky. And another little piece of that story that you might appreciate is in between all that, as I was coming into private practice and as a dietitian, we want to food to be medicine. I, and that can get thrown a lot of ways, right? And so I wanted food to be medicine. And I had just gotten done with this mm, certification around food sensitivity stuff. And I removed some food. And it, that whole thing was like overwhelming in the midst of being really not okay. Like all the emotions, all of our clients experience. And I remember grabbing a handful of pecans and my eyes swelling up and that had never happened before. So I actually made everything worse through diet restriction, which was pretty cool. 
just joking. And I know we're cool. definitely going to talk about that piece of it, which is that you have the very strong opinion, and it's not really an opinion, the scientific basis to believe yeah, that experience. arbitrarily cutting foods out of your diet um, is not going to help, totally. you know, fix all of your skin conditions. So funny you said that about, you know... It, when we think about why we make changes in our lives, it really depends on the person. And for mm -hmm. my cousin's a really good example. She is diagnosed with lupus and she really had, for the longest time, had felt very sick with gut conditions and just energy issues, hormonal issues, never, you know, really sought answers. She, she saw like one hair fall out of her head and she had like two pimples and she was like, and I'm going to get help. Like, like you said, once it becomes aesthetic for mm -hmm. us, it, it becomes um, more pressing. And I can imagine that skin issues are not only aesthetically a problem for people, but quite painful. I'm sure oh, too. Yeah. In many instances. I mean, we're having really a, an, a breakout of hand eczema since in the last few years, many reasons. And I kind of like, I kind of class it. So there's so much I want to say about what you just said, which, so <laughs> let me just like piecemeal a few things, inflammatory buckets, what's contributing to the inflammatory buckets, come back to that later. Like Heck when yeah. food makes a bigger difference you know what happens in autoimmunity potentially versus other times like when does it make sense to change where should we be in general all stuff you and i agree about but you just do a powerhouse job of, of explaining but i am excited to have the opportunity to talk about so back to the story back to the story made myself worse with food eliminations lucky to crawl out of that it took a year of self-navigation unfortunately and then I got asked to talk about the difference between food sensitivities and allergies in an eczema group. And the rest was kind of history because then I had a couple moms reach out to me with kids. And it was funny because what's really cool is there's multiple ways to accomplish the same goal. Amazing, right? There's not one linear path. And so the things I used at that time are different than the things I use this time, right? Because my ultimate goal is that it's a less stressful approach, which I know sounds so silly. I actually I chose the name Less Stress Life for the podcast in 2017 when I was looking for a synonym for inflammation. How hilarious that this is also full circle, right? Oh. And my business started in food sensitivity work, but now I'm helping people overcome food sensitivities without restriction. I love it. It's a good thing, right? So so that's kind of where it all began. It was not because I wanted to work in that space. And I still don't even really... On my Instagram, I still have the word eczema on the profile. On my website, I talk about my story, but I don't... It's not the catchphrase at the top. It doesn't talk about eczema, but they find people find me anyway. So you're still, you're still kind of the eczema person in many means, even though you have many other hats that you wear, mm -hmm. but yes, people still know that about you. I sure. think so. I think it's just a, you know, and I think when my colleagues think of me, when they think of eczema, they think of me probably. And that's fine. It's fine. And I don't need to take the whole skin, the whole skin um, niche. There's a lot of there's a bit of nuance there. I don't really enjoy psoriasis, oddly. If people have eczema and psoriasis, it's fine. But the eczema will clear before the psoriasis does. How fun. Um, that's why I don't like it as much. Exactly. Acne means a lot of different things. I take acne. We work on it. It's fine. It's no problem. But I think people just... There is something odd. And I know you get this also. If you've experienced the thing that your clients have experienced, yes. there is a totally different intimate knowledge of understanding exactly what they're going through. And then knowing weird things about it. <laughs> like... It's it's, it's going to so feel true. better if you do this instead of this, you know, which is, you're not going to wear like, black if you have eczema. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because you might mm -hmm. flaking or something like that. It's mm -hmm. so it's so true. And it's so funny that you say like eczema is my favorite. And I I feel that way about like acid reflux when it comes to gut conditions. I'm just like, <sighs> I just reflux. love reflux. Like I do. Mm -hmm. It's it's when you've you experienced experience it. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. I mean, I've experienced every type of gut issue. I'm like the most mm -hmm. gut holding emotional person in the world, of mm. course. But I do, I give so much grace and I mean that so truly to every single physical struggle I've had. And I know you're exactly the same way because it paves the way for a deeper level of understanding and a completely um, unhinged research level on our ends because we want to solve the problem first and foremost, selfishly in a good way. It, it leads us to this like really deep hole that we're willing to go into um, that we otherwise probably wouldn't have time for, for every single condition in the world. So you're an eczema girly. You love yeah. your eczema. You love to work with it. And so really on the walking it back to the farthest point, what you probably were talking about in 2017, Krista, I'm going to need you to walk it back all the way to briefly tell us the difference between allergies and intolerances, because we're going to kind of move and use these different terms throughout our conversation. I want people to understand the difference right off the bat. 
Perfect. And it doesn't really matter what a person specializes in. You see everything else behind the scenes, no matter what. Like people come to you for a thing, but they actually have ideally a bunch. I mean, at least for me, I would rather they have like 10, 15, 20 goals. I don't, that is not overwhelming. That's fun. That's like, oh, yeah. cool. We can improve more things. This is amazing <laughs> that you have more stuff. And I don't mean diagnosis. I mean, just symptoms that maybe you didn't realize were symptoms because they're so normal. Okay. So walking back, we're talking about allergies versus intolerances versus sensitivities or whatever. There's a, okay. Big picture. We recognize what allergies are unanimously. It's an IgE mediated reaction to either environmental or food, right? The research I was looking at long ago was that skin testing was more accurate for environmental, blood testing was more accurate for food, cross, you know, cross checking both was best. None of it's perfect. So we, then we get into allergies and um, sensitivities. Back to one moment about IgE or IG elephant, um, <laughs> you know, like just, to, just in case the were the letters not coming through. That should in theory be permanent. However, there's nuance to everything. So it's not actually always permanent and always reproducible. That's kind of what we like in medicine. It's like, oh, well, we did this thing and it's reproducible. And so this is what you have. Well, that definitely shifts with kids. We definitely know that you can outgrow certain allergies when the microbiome kind of sort of gets in. It's I don't think this is the right way to say it, but kind of set or like largely set by age three. That is a big time that if you're changing microbiota, then you could potentially grow out of allergies is my opinion with experience. And then even up to age five, sometimes people grow out of certain allergies. Like there's whole prevalence rates for different allergies that kids grow out of. Okay. So we know with an ever-changing immune system as a child, it shifts, but does sometimes the immune system change as an adult? Hell yes, it does. <laughs> and so, um, so allergies are, I guess, allergies, but they're, you know, the children thing is a nuance. And then I would say as an adult, if this kind of comes out of nowhere and or people say, I lit up like an alarm or like a whatever all over the place, like everything lit up. Um, that's not quite right. In my opinion, uh, that's like an entire inflammatory overloaded bucket. And so you just happen to be when they're adding that little bit of an antigen there to see what your reaction is. It's just that your bucket's like over full already. And there's several things that can fill that up. So well, I have to add on to that really quick too, which is yeah, that please, please. two, two important pieces I have to pull apart from what you said, because every sentence you say is so critical. I don't want to miss one Krista thought, but the first thing is what you're saying is that, yes, we have always known allergies, IgE mediated allergies to be permanent, genetic, you're done, it's an allergy, avoid mm -hmm. it, or something terrible is going to happen. Even mm -hmm. that, which was so definitive for such a long time, we've now come to understand is, is not necessarily true and that children may grow out of it. And especially this point that you said that's so critical, if it comes on spontaneously, then it isn't this genetic thing necessarily. It could be, again, what we're going to talk about through the rest of the episode, um, something else or a, a dysfunction of organ systems or something like that that mm -hmm. we'll talk about, obviously. Yes. The other thing is now, right now, which must be f so frustrating for you, these food allergy, food intolerance tests are hot, hot, hot. Either the ones mm -hmm. on the skin, which have been done by allergists for a very long time, mm -hmm. or the ones where you send in a sample and then you're getting, like you said, lit up like a Christmas tree. You have every food intolerance in the world. Yeah, that's trash. What, and this is so like, <laughs> yeah, it's such, to me, it's so funny with those because it's like, of course, if your body's in a highly reactive state, mm -hmm. it's just going to be reacting to things, mm -hmm. but it's really hard for people to understand. And these companies are making quite a bit of profit off of these very expensive tests that are getting all of these results. So if you were a person who was having a skin condition and got this result back and it said you're, you're allergic or intolerant to eggs, wheat, you know, of course I want to name the ones that are the most like immune reactive mm -hmm. foods. And, yeah, and those are always the ones that come up like a Christmas tree. Would it be your instinct to cut all those foods out just right off the bat? Um, no, not necessarily. <laughs> um, that's so let's talk about what that means. So we just talked about IgE, that's food allergy. So we generally, and this is where this gets so like, if people ask me this question, well, what do you think of this? I'm like, um, do you have a half hour for the explanation? No, I know, I know. I, I, feel I just bad cannot even, even about it. I cannot even. Okay. So there's allergies. Let's get into the other two. Technically there is intolerances and sensitivities. Sometimes these words get muddled together. I don't, 
care that much if you muddle these words together. Like, I don't get too ruffled by things. But generally, um, let's talk about sensitivities as high as I have seen them based on, I think this is based on, there's like a, a food allergy sensitivity and intolerance Bible by don't quote me, Brost often, whoever. Anyway, it's green. It used to be green. The one I have is green. Um, lots of good stuff in there. Mm-hmm. But they, well, and I mean, just I did training on this <laughs> as well. But it, this is other immune reactions. So I always use this analogy that it's like the food is on stage and you've got Nerf guns. And one Nerf gun has red bullets and those are IgE. But what about the blue, yellow, and orange bullets? Those are IgM. T cells, IgG, that's the most common food sensitivity test is IgG. But that's one kind of Nerf bullet. And so you can look at the accumulation of those bullets or the non-IgE bullets, and that's a total accumulation of those mediators. But most testing is only looking at one piece of it. So the sensitivity test may give some relief to those in severe straits. I'm thinking specifically, and in general, I also love irritable bowel disease, but that can be useful for those people in that state at that moment. It can like help turn off the symptoms while you're working on more. I mean, I just think there's, it's never just that. Um, so we can talk about why that is. Um, but that's kind of how to make that make sense to me is like, it's like the um, food comes in and what kind of Nerf bullet, what color Nerf bullet is being shot at it, okay? Technically, to me, an intolerance is a bit of a digestive, it's all the digestive problem, but it's technically more of a digestive problem in terms of there's an enzyme insufficiency, like a lactose intolerance. Again, we're not going to go to punches around this. I don't really, literally do not even care. The point is, is that we sort of kind of reckon, and, and in like lactose intolerance and some of these intolerant, and there's some other weird ones out there. Like I remember when sucrase intolerance was kind of hot because the reps were selling the enzyme, you know, there was money to be made. So they were like, okay, we'll give you these tests and then blah, 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 blah. And we sell you this expensive enzyme. Um, so there's intolerances and generally medically we recognize that as well. Um, we do not technically medically recognize sensitivities. However, we kind of do <laughs> because there's non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is a sensitivity. And so we, even though we say we don't recognize sensitivities, well, we actually kind of do right there. It's like catching you talking out of both sides of your mouth as a medical provider. And so the reality is people experience reactions to foods. Yes, they do. Absolutely. How about you? Right. <laughs> and, um, but the re- reality is, is to me, food sensitivities are secondary to what's happening inside the gut. And so if you're not correcting what's going on inside the gut and you restrict, 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 you might get some symptom resolution so that this happens to people. This is like a very honest, accidental human thing. I never, I always say like, don't blame a person for being a human. Um, you restrict foods and you feel really good. And so then you get to restricting more and more and more. And now your body really doesn't have any resources. It's already got other crap going on in the first place. And so you bring those foods back. And essentially what's going on in the body is there is, I mean, this is like the most straightforward thing. Probably most of your listeners know this. Um, There could be some other reasons as well, but this is the most obvious thing. You take food in. You do not digest it well because everyone sucks at digesting food because we all have stress and we're suppressing all of our digestive capacity. Like I will stand by that until I die. That is very truthful. (laughs) Like that is the recurrent problem happening. You have undigested things, undigested proteins. You have gut permeability. I also think this is secondary, but you have maybe um, fishnet tights in the gut. Dramatic example, fishnet tights instead of nylons. Nylons are semi-permeable. You should have very small proteins crossing a nylon. Very large undigested proteins can cross the fishnet tights. Now the Nerf gun guys come at you. And so when the, and this is, I probably should have brought this into the analogy sooner. The large proteins cross the fishnet tights because the gut is more permeable, has some holes and then the nerf gun guys shoot at it and sometimes it's shooting multiple mediators at it and then before you know it you have a whole inflammatory cascade so there of course if you change the diet there for a while the problem is is what happens very naturally is people are like i had great success with this and then it just stopped working that's because you didn't fix the holes in the gut or the thing that caused the holes in the first place you didn't correct how small the proteins were getting by how it was digesting 
and calm the entire um, immune system and nervous system down at the end. That is the yeah. real, the real source and summit to me of food reactions. I have this beautiful um, graphic from an immunologist I love. And it's like, there's a lot of things dumping into the inflammatory buckets. I'm just going to quickly go over that. It's like, what's going on in the gut in some capacity. So there's permeability, which is like, yeah, we have thousands of thousands of papers about this. To me, I think there's, you know, what's causing the permeability, like always go back a step further. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's what's going on in stress chemistry. Cause that mess, if the nervous system is a bit of an issue, it's informing the immune system. So what is informing the immune system? What's going on in the gut? Cause the immune system is largely in the gut and also what's going on in the nervous system, hundred percent. And then the other pieces, there's other pieces I probably miss talking about here, but what's going into the inflammatory bucket, toxic burden, blood sugar stuff, oxygen dysfunction. I'm just thinking, trying to think through all the things. Um, those are, those are some of the big ones, but lots of things can fill that inflammatory bucket infections of other types, right? Like we had a, a massive immune, um, uh, assault the past few years that kind of like sometimes kind of was again, that straw that broke the camel's back in the immune system, sometimes causing like essentially just haywire messes, like really caused a, an inflammatory cascade. And so you have this inflammatory cascade. It imbalances some signaling proteins in the, the, in the immune system, and then you get food reactions. And it can look like traditional like allergy, eczema, sinusitis, UTI, upper respiratory infections, or it can look like you're not really sick all that often. There's a different dominance that can be happening sometimes behind Ooh, the scenes. Let's talk about that for a second. No, I don't know so, if I can talk about it intentionally, but let me pull up let me pull up my schematic and then I can one moment. Please pull up your schematic yes. while I'm asking this question. Get your schematic up, Krista. Yep. <laughs> um, so I think for people to understand that skin is a gut condition or a liver condition or a mm. otherwise yeah we're definitely going to talk about the liver of course we're going to talk about the liver we're talking about the skin i think that right off the bat is lost on some people because what they're not the part of the that they're, the visual they're not seeing is all right the protein is leaking out of the gut or it's leaking into the bloodstream there's this immune response i think we got up to that part how does that turn into what you see on your skin what is happening between the gut and the actual external thing that you're seeing what is okay. that simply let me talk about what is simple there is the gut and then liver connection okay so what's going on in the gut another analogy let's Please. say you've got some messes going on in the gut it's like you got some weeds i like to use the analogy of dandelions the dandelions grow they give off seeds right anything going on in your gut can do this as well it's called endotoxins of course right and so bacteria pathogens etc give off endotoxins and so there's just more waste when there's stuff happening in the gut or if you're not digesting well you can have some of some things crossing the blood brain barrier so anyways you have more waste when things are not being digested and sent to where they're supposed to be you're like a, you're also missing the nutrient right so like then you're accidentally getting nutrient deficiencies and none of the none of the things nutrients make everything happen in the body technically they make the enzymes work which make everything else work and so if you're low in nutrients then all the systems are like okay i can't quite keep up as well but i'll keep trying and it steals from other areas back to the dandelions the dandelions get let out someone's got to clean up the dandelions your drainage and detoxification system there's a so like gut liver connection so the liver or drainage and detoxification system can get overloaded. The lymph can be involved, obviously, here too. Let's talk about what are the drainage and detox systems. The Please. liver, the kidneys, so the colon, technically, skin, um, and even respiration are some of those systems. So again, um, are you hydrating? Are you urinating? Are you having bowel movements? Are you perspiring? Um, and are you breathing clean air is kind of like some of those inputs, outputs, right? To be assessing, to just make sure that that's called phase three detoxification, that stuff right there, right? And then that doesn't always get discussed. That needs to kind of be yeah. happening first. My favorite, my absolute favorite thing is if someone comes in with bowel issues, and then they have skin issues. I'm like, piece of cake. Because if you're not pooping well or you already have gut stuff, I don't have to even explain how this is related. Hopefully, most people come in knowing that this is related. They just don't fully get it all. And this, the most annoying thing about skin is that initially everyone wants it to be really easy. 
And, you know, like someone's girlfriend's mom told you that you just had to change your laundry detergent and you tried that mm-hmm. and that didn't work. And you tried your skincare products. Little steroid and that didn't work. cream, little, yeah. little cutting out gluten, little stuff yeah. like that. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. It's like, what are the toxic burden inputs that they were changing? I'm like, okay, so you changed a few things in your environment. That's always good for any person, any human in life. But unfortunately, skin grows from the inside out. So if there's dysfunction in the gut, there's always staff and strep issues with skin issues a hundred percent of the time. I think based on what I see in stool testing. And so we know, again, something we actually agree about everyone. Everyone can agree about your dermatologist, the ladies talking to you right here. We can agree that in eczema, we know that there is a staph, usually overgrowth happening on the skin. All right. So if we have a staph overgrowth happening on the skin, we have this topical microbiome, the topical microbiome can get disrupted and then staph can overgrow. So why did the last three years cause a lot of hand eczema? Maybe, just maybe one reason is, and there's obviously more, um, maybe a lot of use of, of like really um, corrosive, I would say antimicrobials and alcohol-based sanitizers disrupted the lipid membrane on your hands, which is naturally keeping things in balance. And that allowed things to overgrow on the skin. And now you have just a hot mess express. I will say if there is an active staph infection on the skin, it is pretty damn hard to put out the fire on the inside without putting out the fire on the outside. So the reason skin yeah. kind of sucks is Thanks because you want that. it to be really simple, but it's internal. It's an inside and outside job. Okay. Because the skin is simply growing from the inside out. So if your body can't poop and get rid of all of its stuff, if, if some of that stuff is not functioning beautifully, the skin is simply a safe place for the body to clear out trash. This is why you see eczema in, I think like one in five children. And as adults, the prevalence is supposed to be much less, you know, so it's like 20% kids. It's supposed to be like one to 3% adults. I don't know if that's actually true, right? But that's like what the literature says. I mean, again, it's hard for me to tell because I just see it all. Right? So You're like I'm a 100% biased. of people have skin conditions. What do you mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, it just feels like, that's like how it. I feel about like reflux and panic attacks. I'm like, doesn't right. everyone have severe panic attacks? I don't get <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, we're a little skewed, right? So you got the dandelions, they let off their seeds. You've got these endotoxins from the p- different types of pathogens. Um, so that puts more burden on the liver uh, in maybe the lymph system, the underrecognized drainage system. It can put it can put burden on other places without really looking like there's not amazing testing for this. Don't expect to go get blood testing for it to show up unless you got some other problems and infection. Like it would have to be pretty severe for it to show up there. And that's not what we're experiencing. Like that's not who we're seeing <laughs> is, is those people. So you don't expect it to show up on a test. This is just biology in my opinion or physiology i guess in my opinion so it's, it's mechanism as opposed yeah, to exactly. study you don't need studies it's mechanism this is how yeah, the there you works. go i know yeah. like so many people ask me for something like that. i'm like mm, it's just it's, not, it's just like how it works. exactly this mechanism it's just how it works um so if the drainage and de- if the bucket is full if the drainage and detoxification bucket is full you're not taking out the trash bowel wise you've got some other nutrient deficiencies and some stuff is just not happening very beautifully in that capacity, then the skin is a safe place for crap to show up. It's just an elimination system. So instead of going out via urine or bowels, it's showing up on the skin. We know that stuff comes out of the skin because you've smelled your sweat before, right? And so just a fun little sneaky thing is like, yeah, when my body odor starts to stink because I'm drinking not enough, like if my, if I drink like a ton of coffee, way too much, um, and my body odor stings, I'm like, okay, off to the sauna and to support my drainage and detoxification. <laughs> to the sauna you go, Krista. Go off to the sauna <laughs> to like get some crap out in the skin. And I will say I got my skin 90% better. No one could see that I had any rashes, but I had like a rough patch right here, probably. I don't know where it was, but a rough patch, like kind of on my chest or neck. And the sauna got me the rest of the way there. Like it helped with that skin turnover. And that's the thing. Like you're kind of at the mercy of skin turnover. It's certainly how long the skin take to turn over. I want to say it's like up to weeks and months um, for the whole thing. Because there's like multiple layers and it's growing from the bottom up. But you could have like an immune reaction and that reaction could be hanging out for, let's say, a month. And you're not realizing that the work you're doing now is actually for a month from now, essentially. Uh, like it's... Let me, yeah, let me give you a good story about that. Something I learned um, from myself and then from my clients. I actually think this is really valuable. Let's say you clear up your skin stuff and then you get like a head cold or something. And then like three weeks later, you have this skin presentation. Why would that happen? 
Because when you get this crap, you get like this sinusy thing, you can get some staph and strep overgrowth, right? It can hang out, like you said, in the system. And then it's just a little too much toxic burden potentially. And it starts to show up on the skin, but it can be a little late. It can be pretty immediate, but it also can just be latent. And so I'll see that all the time. I also see just stuff. I see little like the questions parents ask all the time about their kids. They're like, um, my kid has this fever and they're sick and they're like breaking out. Is that, I'm like, oh my gosh, of course. Like you, it's like you have immune insult right now. It's an immune reaction. Exactly. Right. So yeah. like anything you were experienced can just get worse in this time, unfortunately. And so we were saying that it takes a while to have skin or cellular turnover. You know, Michelle, to answer that question, there's like what's normal. And then there's what that person is experiencing because a normal thing people report after they do a lot of healing. So we should get into nourishment after they do a lot of healing oh, is that they skin yeah. this is they heal faster when they are in a craps place they might say like oh i get a mosquito bite and it just doesn't go away very quickly or i get a scrape and it feels like it takes a like oh you know maybe more than a couple of weeks to kind of like really go away that's very delayed and slow wound healing and so you'll see that there's like what's normal and then what people are experiencing also which kind of sucks and so you have to kind of put it in context there's a lot of um the thing that kills us, you know, is like people wanting everything to be immediate always. And it's tricky. Especially it's like, there's they're, a, they're nervous aesthetically. Yeah, they're nervous physically, of course. And skin conditions are also so apparent and something that your brain can just so hyper fixate on. I can totally understand why that Especially would be frightening. on your hands. And I would say, I don't want to say like, oh, it just takes time and you shouldn't hang out here for years. That's not actually the case. I would say realistic, but not complacent. And so I always try to give people like decent timelines of like what it looks like for this type of symptom. And this is why I don't want you coming in with like some significant rash and trying to tell me you don't have any other problem. Baloney. Don't even start this with me. You start, like you must have other symptoms to also monitor and improve because those may get better before. And itch will sometimes get better before the skin heals depending on how badly it's broken. It's very easy for it to get broken, right? And as a reminder, some other uh, tricky things that people probably know, but just in case, just in case this is new, um, when you break open the skin and we know that there's staph overgrowth and then you itch a different spot that's not broken open, you're now transferring that stuff from one place to the next. So you're actually spreading the eczema around topically as well. So just, that's you know, imp- that's really the more important. you know. This is, this is, and I'm going to do a very brief summary of the kind Please. of visual you drew for us too, which is that what is going on with the skin condition is not only skin deep. It's happening mm-hmm. from the inside and from the outside, which does make it uniquely tricky for you, Krista, mm-hmm. versus other conditions, which though every single system of our body can be influenced from the outside too. So I can't, I can't, I actually am disagreeing with my own argument. Temperature can influence the way our entire body runs, mm-hmm. our hormones, everything mm-hmm. like that. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to retract that. But what skin conditions show up as is when you have too high of a toxin load not enough nutrients to get rid of it and not open drainage pathways to remove it too. Mm -hmm. Quite literally, this is the question that I don't know if you have an answer to, but I've always been curious about what is happening under the skin. Is it just a collection of like white blood cells because it's an immune response? Like why is the skin raised? Like what is it? It's just Mm, blood flow to that area. Good what is question. It? I don't know if I can answer that. I feel like that's like a, a really, really good dermat- question. I feel like that's <laughs> a great dermatologist question. I'm yeah. just over here like, what are the mechanisms that have improved this for other people? But I feel like they are better with the It's not an important question, anatomy. by the way. I just yeah. like a yeah, I just like a visual. So yeah. Okay, so Krista, now that the dandelion seeds seeds have spread and we don't have enough nutrients, and you use the word nourishment and nutrients, and we're going to talk about that too. I think something we've talked about in other episodes, but I need to just bring home for the audience is that detoxification is not this process by which you just eat really clean foods and then Mm. things just like, you know, you're on a juice cleanse and you just wash things out because they're cooling, clean kind of foods. The process of detoxification is a very energy and nutrient dependent process. So basically our body has to repackage toxins and even hormones before they get eliminated through the body. And that is a very high energy, high demand process. So you need a lot for it. So if you're under eating or really under eating specific vitamins and minerals and a word I know we're going to talk about protein, um, it becomes a very challenging process to remove those toxins just by way of we can't repackage them then. And Mm -hmm. then they get recirculated into the bloodstream and -hmm. causes this whole issue over and over again. So what we see commonly is people saying, let's cut the toxins out, which by the way, fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's one part of it. Let's cut the toxins out of our lives. Let's see if that helps. Okay. 
But if there's already a huge burden, like you said, if there's already a huge amount of damage that's been done, just removing the igniter doesn't make the damage go away naturally. And it also doesn't give us enough nutrients to be able to prevent and recover from all of that also. Mm -hmm. So it's important to reduce the toxin load, but then you also have to kind of slam your body with the that nourishment. And that's where I want you to roll with us, Krista, and take us through the nourishment piece. Oh yeah. And there's a little bit, I'm going to, before we go into the nourishment piece, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what you just said there, which Please. is, you know, that drainage detox system. Let's just talk about the liver because it's the easiest, you know, it's essentially a machine, it's a factory. And so the nutrients are the staff there and you show up short staffed and it's like, you just can't really do what you need to do. So when you have a lot of toxic burden coming in. So as you said, I don't know how we make this a sexy one liner that the internet will really appreciate, <laughs> but as people reduce their toxic burden, maybe get rid of some candles and air fresheners, change up their detergent. What's touching your skin and you're inhaling all day, you know, start there. And like, what is the content of what's going in your mouth all day, right? So those are the simple ways of like, what are the inputs that now your body must filter out. Uh, I love to tell this story. So if I may, I'm going to tell a quick story. I remember doing a total toxic burden test, um, for a client one time. And, um, it was, it was the first time I'd done that test. This client had a lot of really interesting toxic burden history as a child. And so I just wanted to see if we could find it, like if we, there was anything of interest, um, as an adult. And so I was talking to the clinical director at that lab who I knew casually because life. Um, and I said to her, Hey, can you tell me context wise? Like what's the worst one of these you've seen before? Cause I like stories and I actually think, that client experiences are always my greatest teacher and what we, yeah, I think that's like much more valuable <laughs> like to actually getting results in the short term right now, which is what everyone's looking for. So I said to her, let's just call her Jane. That's not her name. But I'm like, Jane, uh, can you just give me some context on like one of the worst ones of these you've ever seen? And she said, one time we had this girl, she was a young woman and she was kind of an Instagram influencer and all these different companies would send her free product. And so she would use all these products and she had the worst toxic burden test we've, I've, that she'd ever seen. I just thought that was fascinating. Funny. And she was probably like a holistic wellness influencer oh, who was trying to... I have no, these, idea. Like, I have no like, idea. It's just, I, right. I'm, I'm adding to the story where it doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm literally lying. But it's just, that's so fascinating because you would think again people who have that most access to all of these products these are products that are supposed to be helpful for the skin or whatever the body in whatever way um had the highest tox that's very interesting mm -hmm. yeah i know i'm gonna get to nourishment in a second but you would ask me about wound healing timelines and how that works and i'm actually looking at an image of like what happens with the skin and how it kind of grows up and whatnot and so the less severe it can like disappear within hours to days, right? So if I can get like a child case that's come in with like elbow and back of knee eczema, I'm like, all right, excellent. This should not be too difficult. And then it just kind of gets worse from there. So like, you know, if you've had something for a very, very, very long time, it's like really dry flaking, but also the skin layers are compromised. It just kind of depends. Let's go back to just for a second. Um, when we were in our internship, I don't know if you did any wound healing. Oh I was just going to say, I was literally just going to say this. I can't believe you're saying this right now. I have to, t I tell me, cause I'm, I'm freaking out. I just felt something we did. We like did a thing just now. Tell me what you're going to say. <laughs> oh, I just, I just, I'm thinking back to wound healing rotations and, you know, turning people over and then measuring the wounds. And I like, just was like, wow, but they stick like almost, they stick a device. I mean, it decays from the bottom up when people have these severe like pressure ulcer wounds. And so it's like a cave under the skin. Like it looks okay on the top and then below it's like just falling apart. And so they'll like stick a device in and measure how long and how wide it is. And that's like a whole thing, right? And then you do some wound healing stuff and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that like is going to take a real long time, right? And so we get stuff like that sometimes in these conditions. People will get like kind of a, a rough scab that's kind of deep and just expect that one to take like many months to heal, right? Like people are like, I still have this spot. I'm like, duh. <laughs> it is so bad. Also, Krista, what you're saying that's so important here is also that there's a difference between wound healing and mm -hmm. reducing an immune response yes, that's going to show yes. up on your skin, like some right? tissue inflammation. Totally. Um, like tissue inflammation. Like if you had a histamine response or something ooh, like can that. Can we talk about you histamine? Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. We forgot. Gotcha. We forgot to talk we, about histamine when we were talking I will about never reactions. Forget. I have mass, so I'll never forget to talk about histamines, by mm. the way. I'll never forget. So yes, and I have to add something to this 
this like, internship piece. So there was like an obsession with wound healing in the dietetic internship. And, and like not many people go into skin or wound healing, which is mm-hmm. interesting, but I just had this like in- crazy intense feeling that I had to tell you because I know obviously the focus with wound healing is protein addition, vitamin C and zinc. That's always mm-hmm. what was like the obsession in the dietetics degree. We were always taught that. And I'm just like, oh my God, these are nutrients for liver detoxification that are so necessary. And mm-hmm. I think at the time as a dietitian, I understood like vitamin C for collagen production. Like I understood these things, but I didn't understand how much this functional knowledge like ties in with the allopathic understanding of wounds too, which is like mm-hmm. that it's, it really comes, it's a lot of our liver is very involved, but I just yeah. had this very emotional dietetic internship moment too. When you said that, um, yes, let's talk about histamines, histamines, let's talk about histamines and then we can get into nutrients and kind of, um, challenges and things that happen with nutrients or, or, or just easy opportunities too. Okay. So histamines, I forgot to mention this when we were talking about allergies and sensitivities because it plays into both. People are generally familiar with histamine because they're used to taking anti or they're familiar with antihistamines in allergies, right? Over the counter stuff. And so we know there's a histamine response. By and large, histamine is a normal neurotransmitter that's just occurring. We take it in from our environment. We take it in. It increases through exercise and we take it in through food as a few places. And so we take it in on our body if able and capable, which in theory should be generally most of the time, it should be able to break down this neurotransmitter and eliminate it. We have other ones like this as well, but this becomes challenged when there is stuff happening in the gut because if there's stuff happening in the gut, it's affecting the enzyme speed and efficiency that can break down the enzymes, right? DAO, HNMT that can break down histamine and then the liver to take them out. Genetically, you can be a little slower to turn on that light switch or that enzyme. And then as you add more pressure from other gut imbalances, whatever, it just makes it worse. And then before you know it, you're having histamine reactions. Fun thing about histamine is that it looks like a whole bunch of things. It looks like sometimes allergy symptoms. It looks like skin inflammation. It looks like this redness, but there's all these fancy terms, maybe dermatographia, et cetera. Like there's all these fancy skin terms and people are like do you know anything about hydrodentia superativa i'm like yes but i didn't know it was called that until a few years ago until you guys just kept asking i like i just thought it was like cysts in the armpits i don't even really i don't really care what the name is really matter yeah Yeah, i don't really care and that's fine and kind of like michelle's asking me like the exact mechanism of when it's raised i'm like oh i don't remember i don't don't remember um just because it doesn't come up in practice all that often i'm just curious well it's just just simply not like i love educating but i like to educate like i talk about some sim- like things that maybe actually people care about long-term. And yeah. so um, I don't really care what the diagnosis is. People love a good diagnosis because then they want to know what's wrong with them. And then they're trying to figure out like what, you know, it's like, it's easier to say that than like randomly react when you touch it, you know, or something like that. And that's all typically I would call histamine type stuff. Really sad ex- thing that we're seeing right now is like people having nest like not good responses to the sun or like I'm allergic yeah. to the sun, um, which seems to be a seems to be a last few years thing um unfortunately so there's more histamine crap happening and not ever surprising before. that it's been yeah. the past few years too i've right. seen more hist- histamine bull crap as i would say i call mm-hmm. it histamine bull- bullshit but mm-hmm. um yeah or i'll say to my clients like that's just Conscious. a histamine annoying thing like it's just a histamine thing and sometimes it just is but that you can someone can tell like oh i'm having that histamine reaction because it's very distinct skin wise sometimes because mm-hmm. it comes and it goes quickly for exactly. people sometimes and they're like oh it's like almost like and i think again i'm rolling with mechanism here that i'm not my feeling is i'm very aware that histamines are vasodilators or influence mm-hmm. vasodilation and i'm assuming part of that is also blood vessel changes and blood Mm -hmm. pooling. And that is why it comes and goes very quickly too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I would think that would be correct. I don't know why it wouldn't be. So lots of stuff is histamine style with all kinds of labels. Uh, To me, it's just histamine. And if I'm oversimplifying the hell out of it, I'm like, well, let's just work on that. Um, How we're breaking it down and moving it out. And it makes a huge difference for people, I'm assuming. Which, yeah, it really, it may not be perfect with that, but it may be substantially better. And I would, I, I, I will still go for 50 and 75 and 80% better yeah. than their With percent. taking a little bit of Dow and noticing 50% differences. I mean, that could be right. like life changing for people. It's yeah. not even a question. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I, it just depends on the severity of it. Like what you would do. There's certain, there's like modulation and there's like breaking it. I don't know. Like there's a few, like 
as yeah. we said before, there's multiple options for it, which is cool. So I think that's the most important thing, no matter what, is that if you're dealing with a thing, there's probably good op. There's probably some solid options that aren't, that don't suck. <laughs> so, and also the fun part of functional nutrition and what you do, Krista, is you don't only have to target it from reducing environmental toxicants. You can target it by increasing nutrients. You can target yes. it by increasing drainage. Like you don't only have to hit skin conditions from one angle. There's so many mm -hmm. different strategies. And what I love that you do, Krista, too, is you're like, listen, for symptom reduction, sometimes you got to hit from the outside with pharmaceuticals. Yeah, and exactly. then at the same time, you're hitting it from the inside. You know, you have exactly. to do it in a way that is going to help you and also is focused on symptom reduction. It's, you don't have mm -hmm. to fix your entire liver detoxification and drainage system before mm -hmm. you start noticing a difference. No, you made the best point there. There are times when interventions are really helpful because if you just keep scratching to death or having the stress response from this skin being broken open, it's most important to just get you in a comfortable place as soon as possible so you quit having this like painful mechanism hitting your brain and and um just and continuing also, the whole process i joke that histamines are an, an allergy to stress essentially so if mm -hmm. you are also looking at your skin and getting extremely upset over it and refusing to use medication for it from like a, i don't want to do anything allopathic i'm too nervous mm -hmm. about that kind of way and then that's causing a huge stress response or discomfort response it. in you the histamines are going to be shot out anyway. So it's yep. it, the histamines can be handled from a mental or physical standpoint. Yep. Okay. Totally. I need you to take me to nourishment. Yeah. Take me to nutrients nourishment. All right. So first things, you got to digest the stuff. Second thing, very nutrient dependent. As Michelle already said, she did a beautiful job describing that detoxification is a very nutrient dependent process. So you must digest the things. You must be taking in enough and you must be getting those nutrients there. So two your point, um, amino acids are often where I start because no one reacts negatively to amino acids. It's fantastic. Um, I would say one thing I try to like instill in people is I try to instill, well, I have sometimes people ask these great questions. They're like, if I could just focus on a couple things long term, like, oh, you can always support your drainage and detoxification. You can always support your adrenal and nervous system. You're never going to go wrong there. It's always going to be awesome. Like, just because I don't have a massive eczema flare, Michelle doesn't mean I don't support these things because these were both a huge piece of mine falling apart. And when I get all for years after that breakout, when I would go like drink just crap coffee somewhere, I would get a tingle. It was the weirdest thing. It was like a sensation where I used to have the rash. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to back off on all the toxic inputs for a second. So anyway, side notes, I guess. Um, so amino acids, people, oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, when I'm trying to instill in people, like you can always help support some things when we're talking about when we dive in kind of like, um, zoom in on drainage detox and maybe specifically liver function. There are some herbs that can help stimulate liver function, but there's more nutrients. I always say like focus on nutrients before herbs because the nutrients you need and you can be deficient in choline. Choline is actually a pretty under-recognized nutrient in the skin that does not get, it's talked about in for the fertility world, I feel like, but massively yes. kick butt in skin stuff. And like actually. brain function. You hear a lot totally. about, I talk brain about it, function skin, calling, liver, you know brain what? function, but it totally. kicks butt in especially dry skin conditions. We didn't even, what's your favorite like, food sources of choline? Oh, I actually, um, so there's food sources and it's largely egg yolks. Ugh, That's like mostly what you them. get. But I would say I'm looking for way more for a therapeutic intervention yeah. short term right like much more than that so um supplements that's important are by the way yeah you need yeah, like, I, I like to, to get that for a second. i like to get action happening so even though we want to do everything there's some really cool things you can do with food and that we do with food for sure and then there's some things that's like i don't know if you're gonna be able to get that much in that seems crazy and then yeah. unfortunately so here's there's a um there's always these oxymorons where everything's fighting with each other and some people a decent number of people struggle with egg protein digestion when they're dealing with eczema and they're, they're eating eggs and itching, right? So they're not breaking down these proteins, these hard to digest proteins. And so it's causing itching. So I can't really just have you eating like 10 eggs or something. That's right. like not even exactly. an option, right? Amino acids, awesome, right? Reminder, building blocks of protein. Also building blocks of neurotransmitters. I'm sure you talk about them all the time. Amino sure. acids, almost never a problem. And protein digestion, very frequently a problem. I know we mm. already both know this because if you're working with reflux, there's definitely a protein digestion problem there, right? So ding, I ding, love ding. all these things. 
um, I love all these things. It's like, this is a downstream effect, guys. <laughs> your slow skin healing is a downstream effect of your stress causing low protein digestion and ab- absorption um, situation. So that is number one. Good, t- good talk, good talk on amino acids, right? Yep. Um, choline is a big one to me. I use the heck out of choline. Some B vitamins, some like vitamin A, like you said, sometimes zinc for collagen synthesis. Sometimes I just do, I mean, I like to do just collagen. It's not like an automatic thing. When people come to me and they are on like a typical, um, oh, I want to get into minerals here and what happens in the inflammatory process and how things don't get in. Um, People sometimes come in on this generic uh, protocol that someone put them on for skin, which is usually like zinc and omegas. but that's yeah. not going to really make a difference if you got like a staph overgrowth or something inside. It might also, help I get with nervous. like some... I get really nervous with zinc supplementation, by the way. Yeah, It's yeah. something because that it's I really, proper. really... Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I need to ask you about something too that I don't want to forget, which is like the main thing that I hear with clients who have been to skin doctors or naturopaths or functional mm-hmm. dietitians is the candida cleanse situation. Mm. I also want to talk about menstrual problems um, flaring. I, we have to talk about hormonal flares, but mm-hmm. I I hate to say this, Krista, you can just totally shoot me down and attack me if I'm wrong. But I feel like for me, Unlikely. candida is still not a root cause anyway. And so I think that it's like, there's such a hyper focus on candida <laughs> cleansing and candida, not eating any sugar, not eating any foods that are high in yeast. Mm-hmm. Versus, I think it still skirts around the main issues that we're talking about. What's your take on candida cleanses for skin and candida in general for skin? Yeah, they're straight out of the 1990s, I would say, <laughs> and early 2000s. And I would say by the time people get to me, you work past that point or someone tried that. And that was not the thing. That was like, this is sucks. I'm like, yes, I understand. We are not exactly. looking for life-sucking times. Okay. First of all, fungus does not hang out by itself. We have a microbiome and a microbiome. Um, when you take antibiotics, your yeast can have a party sometimes. I actually talk about this sometimes with clients. So there's fungal imbalances and bacterial imbalances, as I just said. There's certain pathogens that allow these to overgrow. And then I unfortunately see way too much mold influence in skin issues much more than I would like. Like if I need a sabbatical, it's probably because I'm sick of talking about this mold situation, which it's fine. It's fine. It's just that there is a mild to moderate situation, not a severe situation that I feel like I am pretty dang okay at finding for people. Um, And it just sucks. It breaks everything. But because it's adding a lot of toxic burden and skin is just an easy place, safe place for the body to discard toxic burden, it makes perfect sense. So why am I bringing this up um, and pretending everyone knows what I'm talking about? Because mold is just a more aggressive type of fungus. Candida is a strain of a fungal fungus and mold is just a more aggressive form. So have we always maybe been dealing with it in some capacity? Maybe. And we were just calling, like if I see a couple um, strains of fungal overgrowth on a stool test, I'm not going to suspect that anyway. I'm like, okay, this is actually not even super common to see on the stool test. I mean, it's not a thing. I go by symptoms, right? And so, yeah, I'm not going to restrict sugar forever. I would say in the short term, sometimes, yeah, it'll make you flare a bit, but um, it's more like what actually should, in general, let's have stable blood sugar (laughs) and and enjoy food and all of these things, right? I think that's- Tell me about blood sugar. Is blood sugar balance, which by the way, our sponsor for this episode is Very, which is a continuous glucose monitor. So if someone is working on their skin stuff, monitoring your blood sugar can actually be one of the first places to start. Tell me the relationship between blood sugar management and skin and why it's important to um, have that foundation of health. Um, Well, it's- it, let me tell you all the ways. I'm not going to tell you all the ways. It is multidimensional. <laughs> a couple ways is is the one we just talked about and the one we're about to talk about. So let's just do that. Um, so if your blood sugar is like a hot mess express, one, you're going to be con- needing to consume a lot more of these simple carbs, right? And you're going to be missing out on other nutrients. It's going to be quite this like not fun roller coaster. Inflammation sometimes, well, thrives in this higher like blood sugar situation. We know that very, very clearly. It causes other issues. It's like a, a liver thing, like there's a lipid issues, et cetera. So to me, it's like, uh, not like which way it's like, well, it's kind of like, a everything, I guess it could negative. I mean, it's also energy. It's, 
it's everything. Um, one, one way it massively impacts is hormone stuff, right? So all the stuff we're doing for skin is also affecting your hormone health and blood sugar is huge for hormone health. And something we wanted to loop back to was really, really common to see worsening flares cyclically prior to ovulation and prior to the start of your menstrual cycle. There is more crap. <laughs> trying to move out. Your estrogen is trying to break down and be eliminated shortly before or in that time frame typically. And so if you already have tax, if the freeway is already backed up, it just adds to the burden. And so stuff shows up on your skin, right? And we can make that argument about skin eruptions on the face from an acne perspective also with your menstrual cycle. It's just like, how is your body wanting to do it? I mean, that maybe is a different conversation for a different day that I don't really care that much about. Like, why does your body want to do eczema versus acne? I don't it's know. also just like sometimes your body just has a baseline. Like, you know, it's interesting when I had all this mold and histamine issues, which I'm only talking about in the season, by the way, you guys are going to hear me trickling this in the season, but that was mm -hmm. something that I've been dealing with for a couple of years, but I never got a skin reaction once because it's like not my thing, but yeah. I had every other reaction in the body you could ever imagine. But it's like, we could have your body just does this topic it favors things sometimes just is yeah. your thing kind of, you yeah. know, I mean, we're cool. not, this is why, you know, one of the reasons we don't have an amazing toolbox for eczema is because we try to treat it like it's all the same. Right. But it's not really all the same. There's like different things you can prioritize from the inside sometimes. So to be continued on mold conversation stuff later, because yeah. that has been quite an adventure for me, both with clients and for myself. Um, it's just kind of like, ugh. We ever get to not learn about stuff? No, I mean we just have to. I, I think we have to kind of know a bit about it because it's it can come to anybody. Well, Chris, uh, my message from mold was I was like, all right, you know, in the past I had all this reflux, IBS, mm. anxiety, all this stuff that kind of like marked like the first half of my career, right? And it marked mm -hmm. like what made me so interested in these topics. And then I got hit with mold so hard, and during this time when all this histamine release was happening because of the virus and the vaccines and everything. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I thought I learned my lesson before. I thought the mm -hmm. lesson was already learned about my health. That's same. what I've been working with people for, right? Is it the same, same experience for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit, You're right? Like, was actually a lot of that, did it start with a little bit of mold exposure? So fun thing, and maybe we won't go off on this too, too much, but I think you can be exposed to mold as a child or like, a, like you can live in a moldy basement and you can deal with it and your body's really good at dealing with it and just trying to deal with what it's got thrown at it. And it just makes you more sensitive to like fungal type symptoms later. And there's certain things that are exacerbated. If you walk into a place that's more moldy, maybe you come out more symptomatic than someone else. You already had a baseline colony inside that that has not been addressed. I see that a lot. Absolutely. I think, and again, it doesn't matter what food is it, you're eating or it doesn't matter what environment you're in. It matters how it interacts with the exact environment of your body. So it's like yeah. right place, right time. How resilient was your body to handle it? Mold well, makes you look reactive to a zillion foods. Everything. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. And I think it is important for us to talk about this, especially at this time. This season, I also started to like finally talk about the virus a little bit finally start because I think we're all like kind of seeing what happened. And I think in the beginning we were like, what is long COVID? I don't get it. Why are these skin conditions happening with people with long COVID? Why is this brain fog happening? It seemed like such an unrelated cluster of symptoms. Mm -hmm. And now I think we're all putting together what the stuff. heck just happened. It's just immune system stuff for the past yeah. few years. And it's been, it's so important when it comes to skin, because again, we think of skin as being external, and then we kind of get it that it's internal, but it's just so immune mediated and so yeah. important to talk for about. For the one week fix, it might not exist. Sorry. Absolutely. Because I feel like mold, we could spend a whole conversation on. Um, and I think we are, stories, I think we I are think, gonna have a whole conversation on that. I think so, because the stories are very valuable and it has been very experiential for me, learning what works, what testing is most helpful for people. Should you test? Should you not test? What do you do next? And I do think that, and I think um, the world needs some like non-psycho um, education around that. So like, yeah, I think so too. It's tricky. Yeah. We, tricky. I think we'll just do like a nice personal conversation one. I would do that on either of our podcasts, by the way, because I think it's so, it's something I haven't been like super even, talkative about because i'm you know i'm now on the tail end of it but when i was working through it i was like 
all right, this is totally new territory. It, it's, it was totally new. And then now I've found it's been so productive for my clients who are dealing with histamine issues, mold issues, like you right. said. Um, we can learn it or you can live it. And having both, I think, is really, really important. Yeah, One thing I yeah. want to pull us back to that's so amazing that you said, which is that anything with our liver or immune system or skin, the really hard part is that, let's say in the case of you want to have really good blood sugar when you have skin conditions. But at the same time, like we said before, you probably have an issue digesting protein. So mm -hmm. what people end up doing is leading and leaning on those safe foods, which are those carbohydrates foods, because they know, hey, these carbs are most likely not going to cause a reaction in me. Well, they, maybe. You know, I would say actually, I yeah, actually yeah, would say the well, Yeah, you're right. Because yeah. sugar... I would, I would right. say yeah. people do a lot of low carb and find that they're less bloated, maybe, maybe they have You're less right. and stuff because well, they have equally the same problems digesting carbohydrates, in their digestion. especially yeah. if there's bacterial and fungal stuff. So that's where the premise of candida cleanse come from. Like, let's just starve it out. I just not, I just don't think that that works well. Yeah. So, and I think there's, true. I think for people, it's hard if they can't digest protein well, because they end up, if you have low stomach acid, you actually sometimes crave protein less at a time when your body needs yes, protein true. the most. So sometimes it's good to have external measures and at the same time, listen to your body because when all these things are happening, again, your inclination might also be, let me just cut all these foods out because I'm scared and I don't want anything to influence my skin. And sometimes you have to work with your intuition and sometimes you have to just understand more. And maybe that's with a practitioner or testing or something like that. I too. mean, and that's where like, if you don't know what to do, you can take digestive enzymes. That's fine. Like that's a totally great choice to get the food digesting in the short term. It's a great short term plan. Go ahead and do that. Absolutely. No problem. See what happens. Um, briefly on nutrients, we talked a little bit about it. Something I think that will become more popular eventually is that the inflammatory process challenges the cell membrane structure. And mm -hmm. so you can't always get nutrients inside the cell. So sometimes you have to put the phospholipid membrane back together or you like must nourish it back to health in order for the nutrients to even get in the door. So and that's we did a good. We did a fun detox and drainage episode with Dr. John Kim and he talked his, he loves body bio PC. He loves phospholipid mm -hmm. um, formulations. And certainly um, I think a lot of us are coming to understand that the structure of the cell is one of the most important components right. for detoxification too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, and I'm sure you use that with your yeah. clients and skin stuff too, a lot. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, and that's where it's like, so choline really valuable for detoxification, but also a huge player in phospholipid membrane of every cell. So if we just think about if you have a bunch of dried up cells from an inflammatory process, a virus from the past few years could be an inflammatory process, whatever, working out inflammatory process. We all have some level of inflammation inputs. Um, it's just when it's like longer term, it can be more significant and more severe. Athletes have the most inflammation, I think. I mean, because we work with health, healthy style people, right? So they have tons of inflammation um, history. And so they're not getting nutrients in. They have a lot of deficiencies, whether they realized it or not. And so, yeah, choline does a beautiful job, phospholipid membranes, vitamin E, other things. Um, so yeah, very, very fun. Sometimes that conversation. Oh, what I was going to say is that when that is really dried up and you put all these cells together, you're going to have like dry skin, right? Absolutely. If people are in a current flare, they are not working with a practitioner yet. What is the first step they can take? I'm not talking about eating something. If it's an inventory of self, if it's a, what is, what's the insights that people should take, um, just in the middle of a flare right now and not knowing where to look? Um, that's a good question. We didn't talk about, uh, it depends on the priority, which it's fine. So let me just try to, um, big picture it. I always recommend people do a symptom survey, like go online and Google multiple symptom questionnaire symptom survey. So you can see what all the big picture stuff is. Cause sometimes you only see the most glaring issue and you don't really realize all the other stuff that fits together. Doing that, whether it's you putting together pieces or someone else helping you put together the pieces is going to be great because you must know all the things. And then the other thing, and only if this doesn't cause more stress is like just keeping a journal for a couple of weeks to see if you notice anything. Um, I'm not saying for food, but just a journal around your stress and your hydration and are you pooping? Whatever, right? Like just about your day and like what that was like, just to see if you can see any patterns. That becomes useful information for anyone also at some point. So those would be starting points regardless. Maybe that was unexpected for what people like. There can be I other things unexpected. too. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of... Krista, 
the one thing I know you're going to kick yourself for that we talked about that you didn't go into enough was minerals because I know you. So tell me a little bit about minerals in our skin too. Okay. So back to the inflammatory cell situation. If the phospholipid membrane is inflamed, the minerals are not getting into the cell. The minerals are most inefficient to be absorbed. Certain varieties of minerals, they go in a certain order. Um, so they're all important to me. I'm, we're on this probably the same page now, um, largely influenced by similar people. I actually got into, well, actually got into, um, I first learned about hair, hair tissue mineral analysis in 2009. Thought it was really hokey at a conference because I threw away some notes about it last year and I was like, oh, that's hilarious. I had already gone to a conference about that in 2009. Um, and then I brought it back. I don't know if it was 2018, 2019, but I got more into it in 2020. And that's really fun because if you have, if the doorway is not working for the minerals to get inside the cell, then you're just like supplementing, supplementing, supplementing. So for me, minerals are valuable for tissue healing, detoxification, um, hormone function, energy production. I mean, it just doesn't matter. It's like getting those minerals into balance in the right order and actually absorbing them properly. The problem is, is that our stress dumps them out. And so that's where, I mean, that's really the only significant roadblock I feel in practice for the most part is like gotten nervous system stuff you don't know what you're doing with, you know, and it's like, it's a lot harder to fix that than we think it is. Absolutely. So, yeah, this okay. season, we do so much. I, most of the episodes are on the nervous system and it's mm -hmm. all centering around different conditions because it's one of the foundationiest of all foundations is our nervous system. And it's, I think it's a far jump for people to understand nervous system to skin, but mm -hmm. just the middle part is that it directs immune activity, period. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yep, exactly. That's the most important factor right there. Do you think there's anything else that you will, that we will kick ourselves if we missed? Oh, I mean, I we could literally do six more hours, but yeah, yeah, I really just think I don't even have time to walk you through like how I, I subtype everything, but that's okay. Cause there's a quiz for it. If someone needed the quiz, there's like a quiz on like, is it like more gut? Is it maybe more gut mediated? Is it maybe more liver mediated? To me, that's just like a priority thing. It's like, it only gets more complex. And so I'm just trying to prioritize like, is the nervous system and stress like the most severe if it is? And let me just get you on some, on some adrenal support, some mineral support, et cetera. First is the first line therapy. Mostly I want to do that regardless. Regardless, you know, can't go wrong, but then it becomes more important, like the way the skin stuff looks. So if hand eczema is, is prevalent, for sure that. If it's dry, usually like liver. Um, and if it's like more red and raised, for sure, gut stuff. Ooh, that's so stuff. interesting. Can you send me that quiz? I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, that's so I cool. think it's like eczema type quiz or like I still wow. have this website called Eczema Nutritionist and it's right and it's on there. I mean, I, I built it like once and never touched it because um, <laughs> I thought like I had time for this. I'm really kristabigler.com. Like you can find everything from there, but um, that one is on this other website, eczema. Because I was like trying to pull these versions apart and it doesn't really matter. I'm all the same person. <laughs> Yeah, at the end, at the end, you're like, I'm still Krista. Just come to Krista Beagler. That's it. And we'll be putting that in the show notes too. Krista, sure. I think you gave people so much hope about their skin conditions, so much hardcore science like you do. And people will want to learn so much more from you if they aren't following you, which I'm sure they honestly already are. Where can people find you? How can they work with you or your team? How can they learn from you? I would say if you're listening to a podcast, my favorite place to hang out with you is on my podcast, which is The Less Stress Life. Otherwise, I'm on Instagram, anti-inflammatory nutritionist. And we have good content on Instagram. I just prefer the like, dialogue no, as my jam. podcast is sick. And I would podcast. say, you know, I'm like really welcome people to ask their questions because I want to be recording more mini episodes about little conditions. I know that's what everyone wants to know anyway. So <laughs> exactly. Um, and you also do some of the deepest dives in functional nutrition on your podcast and really other topics too. You really cover um, the scope of, I think, just health conditions in a way that um, most people do not go into that depth. So every single episode is like, you better get your notepads ready because that's your personality. I, it's because I like to learn things. Uh, and if I didn't learn something, I get disappointed. So it's always nice when I don't feel like it was that good. And someone's like, I really like that episode. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad you liked it. I, th I hope um, you think this was terrible because this was an absolutely incredible episode. <laughs> I think it's great. I <laughs> would say that my topics are anything under the health triad, which I'm not sure if I made up, but it's like anything that's under the emotional or nervous system structural or nutritional um, lenses or corners or angles is fair game for us to talk about. And you also have, you actually do work with people in your team with one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one skin conditions. They can come yeah. testing and I, support. I still and feel really strongly. I think you do too. Still really, really strongly about high quality one-on-one -on -one work. 
Um, yes. So I am still doing what I feel is high quality one-on-one work for our clients to overcome a variety of conditions, including food sensitivities, improve energy, overcome inflammatory symptoms without unnecessary restrictions. So yeah, you're the freaking best. And I'm going to leave all those links. Chris, I can never thank you enough. Thank you so much for coming on. You all have to check out The Less Stress Life. If you aren't listening already, if you're on my, if you're listening to my podcast, you're probably listening to Chris's podcast already. So it's almost silly for me to say, but now you better double listen. I hope you are. Exactly. No, they are. Thank you, Krista. Thanks for having me.